I'm Beth. And I'm Beth. Welcome, Welcome to, to Physics, Physics with Beth and Beth. <laughs> Hello everyone. Welcome back to Physics with Beth and Beth. I'm Beth and today we are continuing our discussion of AP Physics 1 in Unit 6, which is the energy and momentum of rotating systems. And so today, in this video, we're just going to work our way through a little practice problem where we have a ball rolling down a ramp. So let's get rolling, shall we? I'm the worst. Okay, so we have a ball that's rolling down a ramp, and we're given a few little pieces of information to start us out with. Well, first of all, we know that what we're looking for is the final velocity of the ball when it reaches the bottom of the ramp. So this is our big picture goal here. And we're given a few pieces of information to help us along the way. We're told that the moment of inertia of a solid sphere is 2 fifths mr squared, so that might be helpful. We might want to keep that in mind. We know that the ball starts at rest. Okay, so whenever you hear the word starting at rest, we know that that means our initial velocity is zero. We also know that that means our initial momentum and kinetic energy will also be zero. Don't know which of those is going to be useful just yet, but those are some things to keep in mind as we set up this problem. And now we're also told that our ball is rolling without slipping. Okay, now here we go. That is a very useful piece of information. Now, let's talk about what that means really quickly. So if we're rolling without slipping, that means our ball is just rolling with, down the ramp like so. That means we're not skidding like this. There's no sliding happening. We are just doing a nice little typical roll like so. And that is really, really helpful information because what that means for us is that we don't have any kinetic friction here, which means since there's no kinetic friction, there's no skidding, no sliding as we go down this ramp, we don't have to worry about losing energy to friction via heat. We don't have to worry about that uh, some of our energy that we start out with is being dissipated by uh, our ball rubbing against the surface of this ramp as we go. And that means that we can use conservation of energy to help us out here. Conservation of energy is one of those things that is always, always, always true. Everything has to obey it from the smallest electron, all electrons are the same size, uh, from all electrons to the biggest galaxy. Everything obeys conservation of energy. So it is always true. It is not, however, always helpful to us in physics. But today, thankfully, it is. So we're going to set this up by saying, okay, we know that our energy, and specifically our mechanical energy that we start out with, at the top of the ramp is the same as the mechanical energy that we end with at the bottom of the ramp. Now, because we know we start at rest, we know that our mechanical energy at the top is going to only come from potential energy due to gravity specifically. So we're at the top of the ramp here with a height h, so we know that our mechanical energy at the start is only from potential energy due to gravity. And now on the right side, our energy at the end well, when we get to the bottom of the ramp, we'll say that this is at a height of zero. So we don't have any potential energy due to gravity. However, we do have kinetic energy. Now, you've probably done a few problems like this before, where you've done like uh, an otter or a child or something really cute sliding down a slide and you try and solve for their velocity at the bottom of the slide, right? You just say their potential energy at the top is equal to their kinetic energy at the end at the end and you plug and chug, solve, and you're off to the races, you're done. However, here we have one new piece of information added, which is that our ball is rolling. Now, even if our ball was staying in place as it was rolling, that's still a movement that's happening, right? As we look at this, we can see, oh, hey, even if this wasn't rolling down the ramp, if it was just rolling in place, each individual piece of the ball is still rolling in circles, it's still moving, it still has kinetic energy. And so we need to represent that whenever we write down an expression for kinetic energy on the right side. Thankfully, the way we do that isn't terribly complicated. We just say that our little ball here has rotational kinetic energy in addition to the kinetic energy that we're used to. So we just say that we have a kinetic energy due to rotation, and that comes from our ball just rolling in place, plus a kinetic energy due to translation. This is the uh, energy that is from our ball moving down the ramp. As we move from here to here, that's movement, that's a velocity, it's moving in a line, that's kinetic energy due to translation or translational kinetic energy. You might also sometimes hear this called a linear uh, kinetic energy or tangential kinetic energy. They're all kind of the same thing here. 
All right, now let's try and plug in some expressions for all of these things here. Well, on the left side, this, or yeah, see all's left, we have this potential energy due to gravity. That's not so hard to solve for. That's just MGH. Uh, kinetic energy due to translation, that's just the kinetic energy that we're used to. So one half mv squared. Now, the kinetic energy due to rotation is thankfully very similar. It's one half times the moment of inertia times rotational velocity squared. All right, now let's just try and plug in for a few things. So I do know the moment of inertia of a solid sphere, but let's talk about what this rotational velocity is. Because rotational velocity and linear velocity are related, right? In fact, they're related with a pretty simple formula, which is just that V is equal to R times omega. All right, so if I'm trying to find a way to rewrite my omega in terms of V, all I have to do is solve for my little omega, my rotational velocity here, which is just V divided by R is equal to omega. So I'm going to plug this in, this V divided by R, where I have this omega here. And I'm also going to plug in my moment of inertia of a solid sphere in for my I here. So let's just do that. Let's say I have mgh is equal to 1 half times 2 fifths mr squared times. Now, whenever I plug in v divided by r for omega, I have to remember this omega is squared. So this whole thing is squared since I'm plugging it in to replace omega. Don't forget that a lot of students are tempted to just say v squared over r, but we have v divided by r squared. This whole expression is squared. Don't forget that, okay? We see a lot of students make that mistake. Plus one half mv squared. All right, um, and now we know that we're trying to do solve for an expression that gives us our velocity at the end of the ramp, right? So we know we're trying to solve for v, so why don't we just combine some of our terms and see if we can swish things around and, and get that alone on one side. So here we have mgh. I'm just going to multiply this through and distribute the squared. So 1 half times 2 fifths is just 2 tenths mr squared times v squared over r squared plus 1 half. That's 2 m v squared. All right, so here I'm going to notice that I have an r squared divided by r squared, so those cancel. I'm also going to notice that in every single term here I have an m, so I'm just going to divide everything by m and it's all going to go away, so that's nice. That makes my math a lot less gross. So now all I have is gh is equal to 2 tenths v squared plus 1 half v squared. All right, well, if I have 2 tenths of something plus 1 half of something, 1 half is equal to 5 tenths. So 2 tenths plus 1 half would be equal to 2 tenths plus 5 tenths, which is 7 tenths. is equal to gh. And now we just solve for v and then we're done. So gh, I'm going to divide both sides by 7 tenths, which is the same as multiplying by 10 sevenths. So I have 10 gh over 7 is equal to v squared. So I'm going to take the square root of both sides and that is equal to my velocity. So the velocity that I have at the bottom of the ramp is equal to 10 times the acceleration of gravity times my height divided by 7. And it's it, one interesting thing to note is that the mass of our ball isn't anywhere in this, which makes sense, right? We already know um, from talking about our free fall problems, uh, the famous experiment where if I drop a cannonball and then a much heavier cannonball at the same time, they hit the ground at the same time, the mass of my ball shouldn't affect how quickly it gets to the bottom of the ramp, right? So it's good that that's not in there, that makes sense. Um, and let's just plug in the values that we know uh, to solve for this. So we know that g is 9.81. So this is equal to, let's go here. So we have the square root 
of 10 times 9.81 times h, which is 6 meters, divided by 7. We know that that's equal to v. And so if we plug that into our calculator, we end up finding that our velocity of our ball is 9.17 meters per second. And that is it. All right, so that was quite a lot of math, quite a lot of algebra, but all that we did was remember the conservation of energy. Because we didn't have friction, we could use the conservation of mechanical energy. At the beginning, we had our potential energy due to gravity. At the end, we had our kinetic energy both due to rotation and due to translation. So our normal plain Jane kinetic energy and our new spicy kinetic energy due to spinning. We plugged in expressions for that and tried to simplify and solve for V, and that was all we did. So thank you so much for sticking with me through all this. I know this was a lot of math, but you guys are troopers. Um, yeah, thank you so much for uh, going through this problem with me. I hope you guys have a lovely day and happy physicsing.